cheer again, hug again, to play, to work, to visit, All right, man. to breathe. And, uh, get the show on the road. Great, now is Everyone. not the time to give up. We are stronger than this virus. When it's your turn, roll up your sleeve and stick it to COVID. What I miss is uh, being out there, coming through the gate and getting ready to play. I miss the, the noise that Ryder fans bring. If I was talking to Ryder fans, I would say, get your shot, be ready, because we're gonna have a football season and we need you in the stadium. If you really ever good. had to look a child in the so eye so that's for taking the time to join us today, I would just uh, start by asking everyone to make sure that your audio and video are muted so that we can keep the, uh, the stream and audio clean for everyone else. Uh, today, we will have Mental Health and Addictions Seniors and Rural and Remote Health Minister Everett Hindley. He will be joined by Chief Medical Health Officer Dr. Saqib Shahab, as well as Saskatchewan Health Authority CEO Scott Livingstone. We'll have opening remarks from Minister Hinley, and then we'll go to questions. Uh, if you could just use the raise hand feature at the top of your screen. If you want to ask a question, I'll call on you, and then you can unmute yourself. Minister Hinley, uh, we'll go to you. Great. Thanks, Matt. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, today. Saskatchewan's vaccination program continues to enjoy huge uptake across all age groups, but especially with our seniors. As you know, residents of long-term care homes and personal care homes were the very first Saskatchewan people prioritized at the start of our vaccine rollout back in January. Mobile clinics visited every long-term care home and personal care home in the province, delivering not just first shots, but also second shots. So now nearly every resident is fully vaccinated. And because of that, and because over 60% of all Saskatchewan adults have now received at least their first shot, we are able to further ease visitor restrictions at long-term care and personal care homes throughout the province. Now these restrictions were amongst the most difficult measures our government imposed throughout the entire pandemic. And they were also the most necessary. But now, because of the protection that vaccines are providing, we can ease those restrictions further. And we will do so in alignment with the three steps in Saskatchewan's reopening roadmap. So on May 30th, when Saskatchewan moves to step one, all residents of long-term care homes and personal care homes will be able to welcome an unlimited number of visitors. So two at a time and up to four at a time outdoors. This replaces the previous requirement that had 90% of residents in long-term care homes needing to be vaccinated, to be fully vaccinated before allowing visitors. We are also very close now to reaching our step two vaccination threshold. So the start date for step two should be reached any day now. When step two starts, all long-term care and personal care homes will be able to welcome four visitors at a time indoors and nine visitors at a time outdoors. Our Chief Medical Health Officer, Dr. Shahab, is still considering how restrictions may be relaxed further when we move to step three, which will be likely sometime in July, and we'll make an announcement at a later date. All of this has been possible because we are vaccinating so many people and because our vaccines are working. Today, our seven-day average of new cases dropped to 169, its lowest level in nearly two months. Every shot in every arm makes Saskatchewan just a little bit safer. And it brings us much closer to the day that everything returns back to normal. Today's announcement is one more step along that path, but we're not done yet. So let's finish the job, Saskatchewan. As of today, every Saskatchewan resident from age 12 and up is now eligible to be vaccinated. And by the end of July, we could have everyone in Saskatchewan fully vaccinated, both first 
and second shots. So if you haven't done so already, please go get your first shot. And when it's your turn, also get your second shot. Recognize there might be some challenges as demand is far exceeding supply at the moment, but we're trying to get vaccines out to people as quickly as we can as the supply allows. Let's get things back to the way they should be so we can all have a great Saskatchewan summer. I want to close today by again thanking the thousands of healthcare workers giving vaccinations in our clinics and as well as in our pharmacies in every part of this province. And I want to thank the hundreds of thousands of Saskatchewan residents for doing their part by getting vaccinated. Most importantly, I want to thank all of our seniors in long-term care and personal care homes for their patience and their absolutely incredible sacrifice that they have made over these past 14 months. Not seeing friends, not seeing family, not seeing loved ones. And I want to thank all of those friends and loved ones for their patience and their sacrifice as well. And thank you to all the staff in our seniors facilities for all you've done, going above and beyond to keep our parents and our grandparents safe. The end is in sight. We're going to get there soon. So as long as we all roll up our sleeves and stick at the COVID, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Minister Henley. Uh, we'll now move to questions. If anybody has a question, just simply raise your hand. And we'll start with Alison Bamford. Hi. Uh, this on the strain that they've been under administering COVID vaccines, uh, just largely because they are the only option for several communities in their area. Um, I'm wondering if the, you've been, I guess I'm wondering what you've been hearing from rural pharmacists and if there are any plans to help alleviate pressures with either more SHA appointments and clinics being offered or, or something like that. Yeah, I'll just take a, a quick stab at that and then and allow Scott to jump in. Uh, we have been hearing uh, some concerns from, from pharmacies. I know I've been hearing it uh, locally here in, in Swift Current. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the opening comments, uh, it's uh, it's great because we have a, you know, a, a great demand for, for the vaccines, but uh, we're having trouble keeping up just based on, on the supply we're receiving. And uh, uh, Scott might be able to answer a bit further about uh, what we might be doing. Scott, you're on mute. We might want to go to another question, perhaps. See if we can get sure. Scott figured out. Allison, if you have a follow-up, you can go ahead and we'll see if we can get Scott unmuted. Uh, that's all from me. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Mark Smith. Thank you. Um, why was the 90-day wait period to receive a vaccine lifted for people who have had COVID-19? Dr. Shah. Yeah, thank you. So... You know, initially we had very, um, so there's no contraindication to get vaccinated within the 90 days, uh, as long as you're po post your 10 day infectious period and otherwise well. Um, but we also knew uh, right from uh, um, last year that once you got clinical COVID, it is unlikely for you to get reinfected for 90 days. So when we started vaccinations, because vaccine supply was so limited, it was appropriate to have the 90 day wait period primarily because um, people who had uh, developed COVID um, were at very low risk of getting reinfected within 90 days. Uh, but now, of course, because vaccine supply is abundant, it's important that we all get vaccinated, uh, you know, when we become eligible by age, uh, first dose and then second dose. And that's why the 90-day period has been lifted. Uh, but even before, you know, uh, if someone showed up at a clinic, um, and they were within the 90 day period, they were accommodated because of course, uh, you know, we wanted to maximize uptake, but right now there's no concern from the supply side either. Thank you. You have a follow up, Mark? Yes, um, with it being the long weekend coming up and people 
heading out traveling and, and camping, that kind of thing. What do people need to remember when they head to campsites and, and what kind of advice are you giving the people as, as they prepare for a long weekend? Hi. So, you know, I think we've all become really well versed on how to uh, navigate uh, what we are able to do and enjoy the great outdoors during the age of COVID. So, you know, of course, if you're feeling unwell, anyone in your party or household is feeling unwell, stay home, get tested. Um, if you while uh, do all of your shopping locally before you head to the campsite uh, so that you have most of the stuff you need. And then obviously when you're at a campsite, you know, um, I think it's important for all of us to enjoy the great outdoors in a way that we keep uh, each other safe. So, you know, when you're in a common indoor area like a washroom or other area, you know, uh, or a, a local store, you know, wear, wear your mask, keep physical distancing. Uh, I think those principles have worked well for us and, and uh, they'll, they will continue to work. And of course, um, get vaccinated if you haven't already. And uh, Scott can confirm, but you know, if you are at a campsite and th that's where you become eligible, you could get vaccinated at, at, at the clinic near where you are at that time. I think you can get vaccinated anywhere in Saskatchewan as a Saskatchewan resident. So I would encourage that even if you're camping and you become eligible, seek out a vaccination clinic where you are instead of waiting to uh, get vaccinated when you come home. Thanks. Scott, were you able to get your mic unmuted? Yes, I am. So, Allison, just with respect to your question regarding pharmacies and some of the the information that's coming forward about the challenges folks are having booking at clinics, I just point out with the pharmacies on board uh, and SHA drive-through clinics, etc., we've had you know huge numbers of vaccines on a daily basis, depending upon our, our weekly supply. But we are looking at how we support pharmacies in delivering vaccines uh, through the the booking process. It is a little different. That's one of the challenges folks are seeing a different booking systems per pharmacy and, and different ways, but we are highlighting some of those changes very quickly on the website. So not just listing pharmacies that are available, but also uh, how to access their booking systems, whether that's online or uh, by telephone. As well, we're always looking at um, how we can enhance clinic availability. Uh, as you know, we're, we're reducing some of the book clinics in June uh, for us, uh, HA, almost all of them so that we can focus on schools. Well, we are maintaining our drive-throughs and walk-ins and looking at how we make more booked appointments available uh, on a regular basis. But I think as pharmacies have hit their stride and, and uh, the logistics of getting the Pfizer vaccine to pharmacies uh, at regular time frames is going to really help pharmacies. And as we gear up more doses in June with more deliveries of Pfizer and, and hopefully some of the logistics uh, change so that we're able to store it for a longer period of time, we've been waiting for that decision to come. Uh, you'll see much more availability uh, in the upcoming weeks. And again, you know, we wish we could vaccinate everyone today. Uh, it is a supply issue. It's not a delivery issue. Um, but as we see, get, receive more vaccines over the weeks to come, we will uh, very, uh, very readily be able to vaccinate all residents who want one. Thank you. And we'll go to Lara Fomina with six uh, CQM. Hi, thank you so much for uh, taking my question. Um, there is a new nationwide uh, mixing and matching uh, vaccine trial going on of 1,300 participants across the country, and it looks like there are six provinces taking part in that. Why is Saskatchewan not taking part in that? So clinical trials uh, happen, you know, with uh, partners across different provinces, so it's not essential that all provinces take part in these kind of trials. Obviously, they uh, once the results are in, uh, they help everyone. And of course, as you know, we, we're following similar trials in the UK, other parts of Europe. And of course, you know, the advantage of that is that while at present we recommend you get the same second dose of the vaccine you got as a first dose, certainly there's good evidence to support that if for whatever reason uh, a second dose of Moderna was not available and it is difficult to wait for Moderna to arrive. You could potentially get a second dose of Pfizer, for example, and then for viral vector vaccines like AstraZeneca, we're waiting information on if someone got AstraZeneca first dose, could they potentially get a second dose of Pfizer again? We, we, you know, several uh, studies have shown uh, promising results from Europe. We're waiting on uh, information from the UK, and you know, going forward, looking into the future, uh, hopefully uh, our two-dose program will focus and finish. And we'll have low case numbers, and we'll we'll 
enjoy a great summer and enter into a safe fall. But for the long term, you know, uh, over time, if there's a need for booster shots for especially those who are at higher risk, for example, in the going forwards, uh, you know, uh, these studies will help answer those questions um, for the future as well. Thank you. You have a follow up question, Laura? I do. Yes, thank you. Um, so then when the second dose schedule, I mean, I know it's already begun, but um, for those who received AstraZeneca as their first uh, vaccine dose, will there be a choice in Saskatchewan for those who would like to get uh, AstraZeneca as their second dose, or will they be permitted to get a Pfizer dose for their second dose? So for all vaccines, uh, the clinical trials were based on the initial clinical trials on which the vaccines were licensed were based on getting the same second dose and all three vaccines have shown excellent results. And so for the vast majority, uh, the recommendation would be to get the same vaccine as the second dose. But having said that, um, you know, if we um, um, uh, if uh, if the, the, result, the studies that I mentioned on first dose AstraZeneca, second dose Pfizer, if they show that they uh, we already know that getting a second dose Pfizer can cause more local side effects, more systemic side effects. We're waiting on some immunology data from the UK, but if those studies show that a second dose Pfizer is as good as second dose uh, AstraZeneca, then for those circumstances, based on those results, we are still waiting for that. Uh, those results by end of May, but based on that, if for some reason uh, someone was unable to get a second dose uh, AstraZeneca, if the if first dose was AstraZeneca, um, you know, that could be a possibility, but we have to wait till the end of May, early July, for uh, June for that assessment. And, you know, there's time because no one who got AstraZeneca is at their 12 month period. But as I said before, for Pfizer and Moderna, that answer is still available that while the preference is you get the same mRNA vaccine in second dose, Pfizer or Moderna, um, if for some reason you uh, uh, that second dose is not available locally and the wait is too long, you can safely get another product. And, and we're awaiting further confirmation from studies, study results to uh, state the same for Astra, uh, AstraZeneca. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll go to Murray Mandrick with the Leader Post. Uh, question for the Minister. The Saskatoon police uh, issued today uh, photos on social media of people in violation of public health orders at rallies. I guess I want to know what the government's response to this is, if they support that action. And can you please clarify if there'll be additional fines, if uh, uh, there'll be withholding of driver's licenses, others? Uh, last time I think we talked to Minister Wyant, uh, I think it was a little speculative as to what the government was going to do. So can we have further clarification from the government if it's uh, creative position related to those matters? Sure. Thanks, Marie. Uh, I, I haven't seen that, that yet. What's been so, uh, circulated on social media, but uh, you know, obviously, we're we'd be uh, taking a very close look at at the situation here. Um, you know, uh, the rules are, are the rules. We're you know, we're, we're there's a reason we have these restrictions in place, and it's in order to you know to get where we are today to make sure that that people are safe and and uh, and that we keep uh, you know COVID nineteen under control uh, across Saskatchewan. So you know, we we take this all very seriously. It's important that uh, that we're you know all on the same page. As we as we try to go through this, and by and large, the vast majority of people in Saskatchewan have have followed the uh, restrictions. And uh, and but you know when there's situations like this that arise, uh, our officials will be looking uh, very closely at uh, uh, what's transpired and, and what our options are. Do you have a follow up, Murray? Uh, can you clarify the position related to uh, whether or not driver's licenses? Uh, will be withheld for non-payment of fines, other more punitive actions in terms of what the government can and cannot do, uh, and whether if some of their own public employees are identified at these rallies, whether there'll be consequences? Yeah, it's it's part of our, our you know what we have for options in terms of uh, uh, what's out there for uh, enforcement measures and uh, and for um, um, you know repercussions for, for people. So um, I know this is something that uh, the Minister of Justice and and his officials have looked at very closely. Of course, talking and you know in concert with the uh, the SHA and, and our public health inspectors and and, and those that uh, have to enforce the restrictions. Um, there there's a reason that these uh, that we've put these tools in place and uh, you know we, we would be taking a, a very close hard look at, at how uh, and when we're going to uh, to utilize some of these tools. We'll go to Connor O'Donovan with Global. 
Hey, I'm just wondering if you have um, updated stats on the number of uh, care home residents who have been fully vaccinated and I guess extension uh, is that number why there's no, uh, I guess, minimum total vaccination, I guess, threshold uh, before care homes can, you know, relax the restrictions to what is, has been included in the announcement? Yeah, I think the most current stats I have are 96% of long-term care home residents have received first doses and uh, about 89% have received uh, second doses. Um, so, you know, we, we, we've we seen a vast majority of residents in our long-term care and personal care homes have have been uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, that being said, when we, when we first announced the visitation, uh, the easing of the visit visitation uh, re restrictions about three or so odd weeks ago, um, we set the, the level of 90% of residents uh, needing to be fully vaccinated in three weeks past that uh, as a very uh, cautious approach you know based on you know advice from from dr shahab and looking at what other jurisdictions were doing and and recommending uh, what we found was that and i think the most recent stats i have are that uh, as of, uh, i think yesterday about 44 percent of of uh, of long-term care homes had had met that 90 percent threshold and you know for a variety of reasons there were uh, homes that were not able to meet meet it you know you think of for example some of these care homes might only have eight or ten people in them and if one person isn't vaccinated they might not hit that 90 percent there's people who can't get vaccinated because uh, perhaps they're allergic or there might be other reasons they've chosen not to uh, i know even in, in my home community of swift current where we have a fairly large long-term care facility uh, the meadows has you know 225 uh, beds and, and residents and, and they didn't meet the, the 90 percent so it was something we heard about as, as government i heard about it as the mla administer that uh, that we needed to perhaps take a second look at that and uh, you know because of the, the the large uptake of vaccines and how effective they've been across uh, uh, the entire population but particularly particularly our, our seniors uh, we felt that uh, you know there's still going to be you know rules that have to be followed there will still be masking and temperature checking and all that sort of stuff when you go to visit a uh, you know a family member at, at a long-term care facility but we just felt with where we're at right now that's safe to, to further ease the restrictions do you have a follow-up question connor sure uh, perhaps for, for dr shahab just with this being the potentially the last long weekend under the current uh, gathering restrictions i guess i was wondering if, if you know if there's any data that suggests that long weekends have any effect on uh i guess case rates in saskatchewan and if there's anything i guess you can say to sort of help uh help saskatchewan residents get through this sort of final long weekend you know, before we do ease restrictions and we can gather, you know, to some capacity again during uh, occasions like this. Yeah, so, you know, we still are under fairly tight um, uh, restrictions as they relate to no indoor gatherings between households. Um, and outdoor we've seen is, you know, as long as you keep your physical distance, um, you know, is, is much safer. So we've always had up to 10 people can gather outdoors um, you know, um, uh, so, uh, you know, I think, you know, given that we still are province-wide restrictions, no indoor gatherings of up to 10 people, you know, uh, I foresee no concerns over the long weekend. But again, you know, all of us need to do our bit if we're out camping or at a cabin or just enjoying the great outdoors closer to home, that we just, you know, keep everyone safe. Um, but certainly with a higher vaccination rate, uh, we are not uh, seeing, uh, expecting any signals of concern for this long weekend. And of course, you know, very soon we are entering step one where we can have up to 10 people indoors in our homes if we choose to. And we can have outdoor gatherings uh, in a public place for up to 150, indoor public gatherings up to 30. So that's where we start, need to start planning ahead. And like I said, some people are really keen to have those uh, participate in those events. Some want to be a bit more cautious, wait it out till they've got the second dose. and that's all fine and we just need to develop our own comfort level. Um, and again, uh, like I said, for camping, uh, we still need to do our bit that um, till, as long as we have a, a COVID issue in Canada and in Saskatchewan, stay home if you're sick, even if you were invited to that long awaited event, get tested. Um, when, when you're at an event, you know, follow all the public health guidance at that time, whether that's physical distancing, mask use of indoors, uh, caution around um, food service, uh, And whether it's graduations or ceremonies or weddings, they will follow the guidelines over step one and step two. And, you know, we'll continue to monitor carefully uh, with a highly vaccinated population and with adherence to guidelines. We hope we won't see large super spreader events. We may see clusters. But again, you know, it depends on all of us doing a bit to get vaccinated. The higher our vaccine uptake, 
the higher the proportion of people at a, a place of worship, at a ceremony, wedding, who are vaccinated, the less likely we are to see a super spreader event. And finally, I'll say, you know, if we choose to remain unvaccinated, our risk today remains exactly the same as it was in February 2020. You know, COVID is a serious illness. Um, vaccination protects you to a large extent. But if you choose to remain unvaccinated, you put yourself at risk and you put your friends and family at risk as well. And while breakthrough um, infection rates are very low at 1%, um, really they can cause uh, serious illness, especially in the frail elderly. So that's just something we need to keep in the back of our mind if you still haven't stepped forward to get vaccinated. Thank you. We'll go to Carol Thompson with TJWW. Hi, I was just wondering, uh, maybe you don't know this off the top of your head, any of you, uh, how many people in Saskatchewan received the AstraZeneca dose? So around 73,000 people have received the first dose of AstraZeneca. Um, uh, so that's, uh, and but uh, the bulk of vaccines around, um, uh, Scott, you may be able to present the percentage have been Pfizer. Second uh, highest number has been Moderna around 20% and AstraZeneca around 14%, so 73,000. Do you have a follow-up question, Carol? Uh, I don't, I, I have a feeling this is not something that anyone can answer because I was just wondering about AstraZeneca's supply. At this point, uh, I imagine the federal government is sort of holding off on it for now. So because uh, most provinces, including Saskatchewan, are no longer giving first doses, uh, the number of people who have received first doses is remaining static at 73,000. Uh, of course, Pfizer, Moderna, number of people who are receiving Pfizer especially, and Moderna is going up and up. So based on that, uh, there is planning that there will be AstraZeneca available for second doses. That's coming in in time for people to get the second dose at 12 weeks. So that is in the works. And as I discussed, um, uh, options for interchangeability are also being studied, but we have till the end of May and early June to make those determinations. Uh, I'll just maybe pause if Scott, you had any further comments. <clears throat> no, I have nothing to add. Thank you, Dr. Schraub. Okay, we'll go to Adam Hunter with CBC. Hi, I'm uh, wondering for Scott, uh, the drive throughs in Saskatoon, Lloydminster, Regina, I think all closed down sooner than anticipated today. Um, is that due to supply in the drive throughs because we've moved vaccines to the pharmacies or why have they uh, closed so quickly other than, I guess, demand? Um, can you just let us know what the update is on that? Thanks, Adam. So, so as you know, we're we're splitting our, our basically our shipments with Pfizer with pharmacies 50-50, and uh, you know the drive-throughs are it's a it's a supply issue and and a demand issue. We we have uh, you know committed to opening up the drive-throughs as much as we can with as much vaccine that we have available. Um, the good news is uh, one that there's lots of good news. One, the drive-throughs are are popular too. We see lots of young folks and lots of people coming in. To get their doses, um, as we move forward, we'll we'll try to expand uh, drive-throughs as much as we can with available doses as we wind down some of our booked appointments and focus on kids, but also focus on more of a regular cadence with having uh, the drive-throughs open. I think it's it's more of a temporary issue, Adam, as vaccine supply continues to increase. But certainly, uh, understand the frustration people have when they come by the drive-through, but it, and it's full. But on the other side of it is. It means thousands of residents in the province are choosing to get vaccinated, which is uh, the other side of the story. You have a follow-up question, Adam? Yeah, this is on the same uh, vein. How are we going to manage the transition from booked appointments with through the SHA into pharmacies with uh, those booked appointments going away, as you mentioned, in June? Um, so people calling in the next couple of days for you know, 80, 70-year-olds eventually, will they have to phone the pharmacy? Um, will the SHA be di di directing them to a pharmacy? How will that work? Can you give people a, a, a little bit of a, a game plan as to what to do when that time comes, when the switch comes? Okay. So, so first of all, Adam, it's already happening. So, so anybody in the province who is eligible for vaccine 
uh, can either come through a drive-through uh, at the SHA or have their second appoint or second vaccine through the drive-throughs or even some of the walk-in clinics. And, and pharmacies are already pick, picking up appointments and have done so since they've started. And now that it's expanded to over 350 pharmacies, there's, there's, there's many more options. One of the big chains that we're trying to help support people through is, is the fact that there, there's not a single booking system for all the pharmacies. It's, it's multiple ways. And it's one of the things I mentioned earlier, how we're going to enhance uh, the information on availability for pharmacy clinics by not just listing the number of pharmacies that are providing vaccinations, but um, listing links to their online booking systems, their phone numbers if they're do doing that booking uh, by the phone. And as well, in this time period for us right now at SHA between today and the end of the month, we're going to try to open up as many more booked appointments for those uh, 85 plus and 80 plus, because as you know, when we started uh, the process, you know, we didn't have the booking system available and, and we help um, by, by directly phoning these individuals, but we are gonna to try to open up some more SHA book clinics before the end of May to help support uh, getting more vaccinations. But like I said, we are already doing things today. Uh, most of the pharmacies are already functioning by booking appointments or just doing it different ways. So we're gonna provide some clarity on that and direct people to uh, proper phone numbers and proper websites to help support streamlining the process. Thank you. If anyone else has a question, you can just raise your hand. Uh, Murray, I see your hand is up again. Did you have an additional question? Yeah, cool. Um, yes, for Dr. Uh, Shahab or uh, Mr. Livingstone, could you tell me, or can you have you been able to do any kind of assessment as to what is working here that's working better in Manitoba or uh, Alberta where the numbers are up? Uh, I'm just looking for, I guess, some kind of uh, better analysis than maybe I can see or provide in terms of where their numbers are and why they're generally higher and increasing and why that hasn't uh, transferred into here. So, so maybe I can start and um, if Scott wants to add. So first thing, Maria, I would like to say that I think we need to be be humble in, in when we are doing well. Um, obviously, uh, we have a very high vaccine uptake that must be helping, but we have had our tough times as well. And and COVID is unpredictable. Uh, we already see that the UK is doing really well, but they are now concerned with uh, B1617 first identified in India, and they're keeping a watchful eye on that even as they reopen. So I think we need to have some humility as we reopen. Obviously, we need to be very confident and happy that we are reopening but also keep a watchful high eye on what's happening in Saskatchewan with our case numbers, uh, keep on top of testing, contact tracing, uh, following whatever public health measures are in place under currently, and then step one and step two as we gradually relax. Um, and, and I think that will guide us uh, forwards. Obviously, you know we've seen uh, case numbers go up and down, both in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, um, and, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, we're, uh, it, it, there can be a variety of factors. Sometimes it's in the large urban centers that the momentum picks up, which we saw in Regina and took a lot of effort, uh, stricter public health measures in Regina, a lot of effort by all of us, restaurants and bars couldn't uh, support in-service, in-person dining to get over that. And so large urban centers have their own unique challenges. Uh, you know, in the far north, we had unique challenges in the far northwest last year that, you know, surged through with SHA and testing and, and contact tracing and lots of community efforts to, you know, really promote um, 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 uh, all the public health measures uh, helped us at that time. So, you know, while we can be co confident that we are doing really well, I think we also need to be uh, cautious and, and uh, still uh, comply with whatever public health measures are in place and 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 as we move forward you know into step three keep an eye on both of what's happening in saskatchewan what's happening in our neighboring provinces in canada and internationally and you know i think one thing that uh, these global pandemics teach us is you know the fact that we have obviously the good privilege of you know getting access to the best vaccine so quickly while you know the vast majority of people in many countries, even elderly and healthcare workers, still are waiting to get vaccinated, um, and and just uh, you know uh, have some 
uh, they have the ability to be mindful of that. And of course, uh, you know, I would say that once uh, Canadians have been fully vaccinated, you know, it is uh, uh, important that we support the rest of the world getting vaccinated to finally end this global pandemic. Thank you. And we'll go to Heather Polischuk with the Leader Post. Hi there, thanks. Um, just was wondering, like, um, obviously, like parental consent is not needed for, you know, majority of, of teens anyways, like that are going to be getting vaccinated potentially. But just given we have such a high rate, I think the Angus Reid poll, I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, it was 24% might be uh, vaccine hesitant in the province. So, I mean, you're still looking potentially, I think, at, at parents who are going to have an influence, I think, over their kids. So is, is there a concern that seeing those types of hesitancy numbers might impact the number of kids who will get vaccinated? So maybe I can take the initial comments and then uh, Scott may want to add, I'm going to stand later. So first of all, I think a lot of those polls, they have very small sample sizes for Saskatchewan. So the confidence limits are wide. And while, you know, obviously, 24% uh, hesitant would be concerned. Certainly, the way in people have stepped forward in Saskatchewan, you know, 88% vaccination rate and 80 plus certainly shows that actually people are interested in getting vaccinated. The fact that, you know, uh, we run out of vaccines consistently, whether it's a drive through or pharmacy, all show that people are interested. Our number of people vaccinated, 60 and older, 50 and older, 40 and older, is constantly going up. So I think, you know, I still remain confident that the actual vaccine hesitancy is much lower. Having said that, if people still have questions, you know, talk to your family physician, go to credible websites, talk to your pharmacist. I think what we have seen is that um, um, if you have questions, having a discussion with your healthcare provider answers many questions. And in many cases, people who were hesitant initially wanted to wait a bit are getting uh, vaccinated. And we're seeing that, that even now, because once you're eligible, you're always eligible. Even now that vaccine is open to 12 and older, people in their 30s, 40s, 50s still are coming and getting vaccinated, which is great. And that, that's important for first dose, but also to focus and finish with second doses. Um, but you know, I, I will say that, and this also relates to the earlier question uh, that uh, about, you know, as we look forward to a highly vaccinated uh, Saskatchewan, where, where all of us can do more things that we are not able to do. If we have pockets, whether that's within a family, within a community, uh, within a certain uh, you know group uh, who of like-minded people who are under-vaccinated, they will always be at risk of the devastating impacts of COVID. And I think we should not forget that. So while uh, herd immunity protects all of us, including those who are unvaccinated, COVID is sneaky. And as we've seen in other provinces with, you know, may not have as high a vaccination rate as us, but maybe two or three percentage points below, they are still seeing huge surges. And so again, I think um, uh, vaccine confidence is important. Uh, we should not be complacent and just say that, oh, I'll wait and just get it later. Uh, and if we have any, um, and convenience is important. So, you know, I think the SHA and pharmacies have done a great job of vaccine, making vaccine easily available at all parts of the province. but. I think we just need to support maybe our friends and family members if uh, they need some assistance in getting vaccinated. For example, uh, many people booked online for their parents or grandparents. So I think all of that helps to support friends and family members getting vaccinated. Thank you. And did you yeah, and if I could maybe just jump in there too. I'm not sure if Scott wants to hop on as well. But I, uh, you know, I'd echo what Dr. Shahab has said, and that, that I'm very hopeful as well. Um, you know, uh, uh, just what we've seen for uptake so far amongst the, you know, the wide range of, of age groups, and and what I've heard anecdotally, you know, since we've since we've dropped the age to to younger ages, you know, uh, there's been a, a great uptake amongst the amongst our, you know, our younger populations, and I'm just very hopeful that that's going to that that's going to continue. And you know, what's a a much larger sample size is. Is the drive-throughs in Regina and Saskatoon, and the the uh, lineups that have been hours and hours long 
uh, and and it's getting into these to these younger people now. And you know the SHA, uh, the clinics are the book clinics are are filling up and are full. Uh, the walk-in clinics are full. The, the drive-throughs are at capacity. Uh, our pharmacies at this are doing an outstanding job, and, and they're at capacity as well. And and I just think that you know by and large, uh, you know Saskatchewan people uh, they they realize how important it is uh, to get vaccinated, and not just the first dose, but the second dose. And that's what's going to be important as we as we carry on throughout uh, throughout spring and head into summer to make sure. That, that we finish the job and get those second doses as well. But uh, from what I've heard, what I've seen on social media, I think there's a, there's a, a, a larger group of, uh, of teenagers and younger folks that are, are eagerly awaiting a to get the vaccine and are looking forward to doing so. And I just have a, a couple of quick comments to add, and that is, you know, we, we heard very early on in the vaccination program some concerns that people raised around potential safety or efficacy of the vaccine and, and, and saying that it's taking more of a way to see approach. I think results don't lie as we approach 60% of our population being vaccinated, which is just amazing at this point in time of the pandemic to have a safe and effective vaccine available for all the residents of the province is that the results don't lie. We see today, you know, before Christmas in December, we had 240 plus infections in long-term care. We have very high vaccination rates, as you know, and, and, and today we have one infected individual in long-term care. We've heard Dr. Shahab talk many times about the efficacy, both on first dose and second dose internationally and what we're experiencing locally. And finally, although I think it's really important for parents to sit down with their kids and talk about any hesitancy or concerns they may have about getting the vaccine, our school vaccination program has enormous uptake uh, for school-aged children. And even though we're getting into that older group of high school kids. These are kids that we've vaccinated at a younger age and have up to 90% um, vaccine uptake. So I, I like uh, Dr. Shahab and, and Minister Hindley are very confident that we're going to continue to see ongoing high uptake because the people of Saskatchewan are seeing the results of frankly, the most definitive tool we have at our disposal to fight this pandemic. Heather, did you have a follow-up question? Actually, my follow-up got answered within that uh, that uh, round of answers, so thank you. Great. And uh, Lara, I see your hand is up. Did you have an additional question? Uh, just a, a quick one. Uh, it's regards with regards to long-term care homes and with the variety, with the number of variants that we have in the province right now, um, is there any worry about uh, variants being introduced into long-term care homes or whether the vaccines, even when seniors or those in the care homes have a second dose, um, may, may not be as effective as in someone who's younger and whether those variants may be reintroduced into a care home affecting those who live there? So to this time, the variants that are currently circulating, uh, B117 and increasingly P1, the vaccines are proving to provide good protection. So um, uh, while the variants may be more transmissible, uh, protection by the existing vaccines is good. But you know, for the future, till such time that the world is vaccinated and the world comes out of the pandemic, and, and we know that July onwards, international travel may slowly increase, there will always be this risk of variants coming into Canada who may in future have vaccine escape. So that's why, you know, keeping a watchful eye on these things would be important. And that's why the higher our vaccination rate overall is currently, the lower the risk of introduction to uh, the frail elderly in long-term care who currently are well protected by the current vaccines, um, uh, but if are not well protected if they remain unvaccinated, and in future, you know, uh, may be less well protected with future variants of concern. So again, I think we have many layers of protection, including vaccines, uh, but the higher our overall vaccination rates are, the lower our overall community transmission rates are, the better it protects everyone, including um, residents in long-term care. Thank you. Yeah, and just further to that, you know, to what Dr. Shahab said, we'll be watching it very closely. You know, if, if there's a, you know, an area of the province or a, you know, a particular a long-term care facility, a personal care home where, uh, where they, uh, you know, an issue arises, uh, you know, the local medical health officer will be, uh, will be watching it very closely and, and if we need to take additional steps uh, we will because at the end of the day we need to make sure that we're protecting uh, uh, those residents of those care homes so uh, we'll, we'll watch things very closely as they as they develop and if we need to make changes then then we will thank you fantastic thanks everyone that concludes uh, today's availability
Have a great weekend.